If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 478, Wandering Wizard Armor In a funny sort of way ballad enchantments were even simpler to do for Nick than the Celebrimber style he had mastered via effort. This was due to the instinctual nature of the art that did not require mastery via training but merely going with the flow. Nick released all illusions of control and allowed the song to shape itself as it wished as the armor on the anvil glowed and hummed in tune while drawing the mana from the air. Slowly each piece of armor began to connect mystically and meld their individual enchantments together. Thump. 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 The sound of a heart beating filled the air as the cuirass pulsed on its own as the enchantments synchronized on it. The ballad also started to reach its conclusion and with a last note the process completed and the entirety of the mana on the island was sucked into the armor. It refilled shortly afterwards but Nick could care less about that as he looked at the glowing silver blue armor on the anvil in disbelief. Unlike what he had expected the armor wasn't rare or even mythical grade but legendary. Armor, R-I-N-E Saren, not Sauron, Wandering Wizard. Grade, Legendary. Abilities, Autozizing, Environmental Adaptation, Defensive Shield, Flame Lord, Lightning Lord, Flight, Growth, Spatial Skip, Balanced, Giant's Might, Core Repair. Mythical Ability, Wanderer's Sanctum. Once a day allows the wearer to create a habitable location where they are free from danger. Lendary ability, Ballad of Travel, grants the wearer the ability to safely travel to any destination they have discovered previously three times as month. Description, a legendary creation made to be the ultimate traveler's tool. System appraisal, a powerful tool that will change history and forge its legend with every step its wearer takes created by an established smith. Truly a wondrous creation. Celebrimber says proudly. It's almost perfect for what I wanted it to do and even goes several steps further. Nick thought in awe as he ran a finger along the feather patterns on the cuirass. Checking the mission Nick was even more satisfied to see that he had completed that optional objective and turned in the mission getting his rewards. A black leather bound book titled Space and You, and a new crafting style ticket. The book was a very high end tome on spatial magic which Nick was thrilled to have. The crafting method ticket however was going to be left alone for quite some time as he was still figuring out the twilight style and unlike when he got it he was not even close to mastering the style. Adding on a new one might open up his options a bit but it would also force him to split his attention between the two styles which he was unwilling to do. Rather than that Nick preferred focusing his energy on mastering the twilight style and his own magical power. Putting the armor on Nick was slightly miffed to notice it had to make a small adjustment in size in a couple places but otherwise it fit perfectly. Now to see if my wards or Hogwarts wards will stop me from traveling there he thought as he took a step forward while activating one of the three uses of the legendary ability. Instantly the surroundings changed and Nick found himself in the workshop at the school. It was disorienting despite him knowing how the ability worked as he felt like he took a single step and yet was suddenly in a totally different location. This ability is absurdly broken, I didn't feel even the slightest resistance at all. Nick thought as he looked at his surroundings. In that case I believe the limit of three uses per month is quite reasonable as this ability borders on omnipresence. Celebrimber said seriously. Nick agreed with that assessment as well since with this ability he could be almost anywhere at any given instance. Comparing the armor to the staff of Asclepius Nick found that the two couldn't even be compared properly with how far apart they were despite both being legendary items. It was like the armor was a muggle while the staff was Dumbledore, a massive disparity in power. Despite that Nick was still happy with the armor as it was his first legendary creation that was at that grade from the start. The Arda Milmi ring was also legendary at this point but that was because it had grown into a sort of miniature world in its own right which brought about a qualitative change from when it was first created. Interestingly however the ring didn't gain a new legendary ability after reaching that point but the mythical ability turned into the legendary ability instead. Chapter 479, Coming Together Nick assumed that this was how all growth enchanted items of his would roughly work but it was entirely possible that the realm ring was special in this regard. He simply couldn't know until another one reached mythical or legendary grade though. Even his earliest growth enchanted item hadn't grown to that point yet due to the standard way that the enchantment grew. The realm ring grew by him feeding it literal space and matter which were in abundance thus making its growth not very unusual at all. Other growth enchanted things however grew with the person that wore them. Harry's protective ring was first created at the low end of the rare grade but had since then reached the peak of it and was but a step away from mythical grade. The fact remained however that it was not yet at mythical grade so Nick wasn't sure quite what that would change in the ring. From what he could tell by the system the transition from rare to mythical was the defining point for craftsmen to be considered genuinely SK asterisk LLED and by extension the point between an alright item and a good one. 
Nick wasn't quite sure what the system was basing this scale off of but he assumed it had to do with the level of SK asterisk LL that some beings in the multiverse had at crafting. If that was true then he was indeed on a bit above average in terms of SKLL since he wasn't arrogant enough to compare his SKLL with a being like Hephaestus that was likely just as talented in crafting as he was and had far more experience in it as well. It needed to be understood that Hephaestus was born a god and thus was inherently far more capable of learning than even Nick himself was at this moment in time. Add on what was likely thousands of years of honing his SK asterisk LL and knowledge and it was easy to understand how outmatched Nick was in this department. If anything Nick was incredibly happy about this as well since when the Forge God returned Nick would be able to seek out tutelage from him to rapidly increase his crafting prowess. There was no doubt in his mind that the Forge God would happily trade knowledge with him as regardless of all else Nick's crafting styles weren't native to this world at all and thus would be considered new and exciting for the God. With the mission complete Nick could finally relax and focus entirely on his own self-improvement. Interestingly enough Dumbledore also informed Nick that thanks to his work the Ministry had more than enough rings of protection for the wizards of the British Isles and surrounding wizarding communities. Each community only had about three or four thousand wizards total so the quarter million rings he made went a very long way in preparing for the upcoming recovery of the planet. Dumbledore told Nick that he could stop making so many rings of protection but that more would always be appreciated. In an interesting addition Dumbledore also asked for a rather large amount of space metal as the preliminary preparations for the attempt at trapping the abomination had been completed at the coast. The trap was basically a very large formation that looped space at its center that was inactive magically so the abomination didn't notice it until it was already within it by which point it would be too late. According to Dumbledore the formation even had the useful property of allowing things to enter it without allowing them to leave afterwards so the muggle gun he acquired would still be useful. The gun was a bit questionable as it was an old M1903 Springfield bolt-action rifle that Dumbledore had somehow managed to acquire. The old goat swore that he got it through standard methods but Nick had a hard time believing that. He couldn't be blamed since the rifle was practically an antique despite the condition it was in that made it seem like it had just came off the factory line. Still Nick took the gun anyways to take it apart to enchant for his purpose. As it was the gun was nearly inoperable from the magic in the air causing the gunpowder in the bullets to not ignite. As a result Nick entirely removed the bullets from the gun and got to work replicating the effect of them without the black powder. It wasn't particularly hard as he merely needed to engrave a few burst runes on the inside of the shell along with a trigger rune to set them off. Thankfully the firing mechanism of the gun was merely a matter of springs and levers so the gun itself had no trouble at all receiving the auto-aim and reloading enchantment Nick designed for it. Chapter 480, Christmas Nick of course tested the final result and was pleased to find that not only did it work but it was even better than the original way the gun worked as the burst runes applied all that force directly on the bullet itself giving it far greater force behind each one compared to the confined explosions that the original black powder used. All in all Nick considered it a great success even if enchanting each individual bullet became rather tedious for him. As a cherry on top Nick even asked Snape for a non-magical poison that would survive being shot out just in case the bullets actually hit the abomination. Nick doubted that the bullets would actually enter the Abomination's body but he was nothing if not thorough. This request was easily accommodated by the Potion Master as he crafted one such poison in merely a few moments' time. It was a green and purple gel that was apparently toxic enough to deal lethal damage to a blue whale in about two minutes from internal necrosis. Nick made sure not to physically touch any of the stuff as he coated the bullets in it as a result. After completing his highly illegal gun Nick spent the next three days studying the Didrick book until it was finally Christmas morning. It was a cold and snowy day like always when Nick got up that day to find the presents at the foot of his bed. Unlike usual however there was many more than any of the previous years combined to his horror and confusion. So many in fact that the floor of the dorm room was practically covered in them. Picking up the nearest one to himself without leaving his bed Nick read the tag and sighed as he understood where they all came from. These were nearly all gifts from wizards around the world that wanted to thank him for creating Blitzball. I knew sports fans were barmy as hell but this is just too much he mentally complained as he started opening the gifts. He of course checked each one for curses and tampering first of course but he didn't find any like that. The gifts came from all corners of the globe and reflected that with the ungodly amount of local sweets and food items he received. That was what most of the gifts comprised of but not all of them. There were other things as well such as signed blitzballs from a few of the first teams that had been put together which Nick decided to place in a special collection. The teams weren't super famous now or anything but that would likely change in the future making these signed balls valuable collector's items. The weirdest thing Nick got however was a necklace made from the bones of an albino man from an African wizard. It had a strange enchantment on it that apparently boosted one's fertility which earned weird looks from Nick. 
he was pretty sure that it was a cultural difference that made it seem so strange and chose to keep it anyways. Ron had woken up while Nick was opening his gifts and looked like his eyes were going to fall out from how wide they were. Bloody hell just look at all of this stuff. I wonder if I would also get so many gifts if I made a sport too. Ron said enviously. If you think you can then please by all means do so. Fair warning though it's not an easy task since there are rules, environment, and various other factors to consider. Nick said with a smirk since he knew Ron was practically allergic to normal studying. Hard pass. The redhead said with a shiver at the mere thought of dealing with all that. Eventually though Nick managed to get to the normal gifts from his friends and those who consider him on good terms with them like some members of the Hogwarts staff. He couldn't help but have a bit of an eye twitch at the sheer amount of gifts were food related but he knew he only had himself to blame. His monstrous consumption of food was a well-known thing amongst the school and after the reporters went digging for information on him the entire world who read the article. It was so bad in fact that he had been dubbed the ravenous creator by the reporter and to Nick's horror the title stuck. Even the system recognized the title from how many people agreed to it in the world. Still there were a few other gifts that weren't food related such as Daphne's that was a book on healing magic related to curses. Nick wasn't ignorant enough not to notice that this was her way of hinting at him to try and cure the curse on the green grass bloodline. Chapter 481, Bloodline Curse Nick sighed when he noticed this and was conflicted since on one hand he felt a bit bad that he kept forgetting to look into her family's curse. On the other hand however it was her faith in him to be able to just casually find a cure for it that set a dangerous precedent. If he did indeed create a cure then she may develop absolute faith in his capabilities which is very bad should she be put in a life-threatening situation in the future. Nick's solution to the problem was quite simple really as he merely needed to find the cure and then sneakily implant it into a medi witch's head as a sort of spark of inspiration. In that case he will seemingly have nothing to do with the cure at all and thus there will be no reason for Daphne to develop that dangerous mindset. He even had the perfect target in mind for the information after he figured it out, Madame Pomfrey. The school's resident Medi which was likely the one currently treating the symptoms of the curse on a regular basis. She also already most likely had the required knowledge to find a cure but hadn't been able to so. It would take a small nudge with legilimency to convince her she figured it out on her own as a result. All the while Nick would not be suspect at all since as far as everyone could tell he would have nothing to do with the discovery. The key to this plan however revolved around two things that no one knows at the moment. First that he was likely the most powerful legilimens on the planet after following Slytherin's training method for the subject for nearly three years. Second was that he could read any language and thus could likely find the curse itself easily enough in the library if he looked. The reason these were key was because Madame Pomfrey was an Eclumens like every other Mediwitch and had powerful shield around her mind to keep others out. Dumbledore himself would probably be unable to sneak into her mind without brute force as a result but Nick could since those shields were likely pathetic compared to the natural mental protection that Dusk had. In the second case it was obviously because without being able to read every language Nick wouldn't be able to find the curse and figure out a way to dispel it from what he learned. As it stood right now Nick already had two of three of Slytherin's medical curse breaking pieces of information and just needed the last one. Slytherin created this rule of three after a lot of experiments on the subject. The rules stated that a medi-witch or wizard needed three pieces of information to safely remove any curse from someone. First was the method of casting the curse, second was an understanding of what the curse did to the victim and the final was the reverse curse technique that was needed to create a counter curse. The reverse curse technique was one of the first things Slytherin's books spoke of on the topic in great detail and the effects of the curse were observable by Nick fulfilling two of the three requirements. The final one needed to be fulfilled in order for Nick to create the counter curse that he would sneakily feed to Madame Pomfrey who was definitely trying to figure it out herself already. With all this in mind Nick stored away Daphne's gift and moved on to the rest. Lupin got Nick a copy of the Marauder's map he made just for him which was nice but functionally useless for him. Sirius on the other hand just directly sent Nick an Earth Fire Seed which was actually useful to Nick since it will let him create an Earth Fire Atronach. Earth fire was a sort of magical flame found within active volcanoes or deep beneath the ground that added a high adaptability to whatever it was added to. Nick even had a sneaking suspicion that it was what Godric Greyfinder's sword was forged in that allowed it to devour the properties of things that would strengthen it. He couldn't prove it of course since the sword was lost to time and hadn't manifested from the sorting hat since Nick derailed the hell out of the canon events of the second year. Other than that point in time there had been no occasion by which it needed to manifest so it sat within the hat to this very day. Thinking of the sword Nick found it a bit ironic that Slytherin's pet would have been done in by his best friend's weapon had Nick not intervened. Chapter 482, Going to Iceland 
Other than that there wasn't really any presence worth mentioning and the rest of the day was fairly quiet as well minus the small snowball fight the twins started. Nick didn't take part in it but watched from the sidelines while under a shield charm. Not for lack of effort on the twins' part to be fair as they kept accidentally hitting the shield from different angles in search of a weakness. Nick was not foolish enough to leave such a thing however and merely smirked as he sipped his Mexican hot chocolate. Something about the added red pepper really elevated the drink in his opinion and Dottie was always happy to make stuff like this for him if he asked. Ron was also a huge fan of the drink after trying some and had his own mug next to Nick. There was nothing really special about it but it was nice to just sit around and chat with friends without studying or worrying about the upcoming mana recovery and returning gods. Still all good things come to an end and the day soon waned away before a new one started. There is six days left before the holidays and so I should probably visit that place in Iceland Slytherin mentioned to see if my theory holds. Nick thought the morning after Christmas as he was deciding what to do for the remaining time he had left before the classes started up again. From what he could tell Slytherin was at the third tier when he visited that place so Nick figured he would have no issue after going there himself. The country was only a bit over 500 miles northwestish so while flying high into the air at about Mach 1 should get him there in a bit under an hour. Donning his armor Nick placed a disillusionment charm on himself before leaving the castle through the courtyard. Once outside he willed himself up and instantly shot upwards like an arrow released from a bow. After reaching the clouds he stopped to allow the armor to adjust to the environment as he determined the direction he needed to go before shooting off into the distance. Only Dumbledore seemed to notice his departure but merely shrugged and went back to his paperwork. This was not the first time Nick had shot past the wards through the sky after all and the old wizard doubted it would be the last as well. The armor's inbuilt shields covered the head and shoulders of the armor as he flew which increased its aerodynamics greatly. This allowed Nick to bust through the sound barrier and enter the soundless state that existed beyond it. This wasn't to say that he wasn't making sound merely that he was moving faster than it was so he himself could not hear it. Luckily he quickly reached the ocean so those that heard the sound of his travel were few and far between. Nick didn't pay much attention to his surroundings as he flew as the only things he needed to watch were in front of him in the form of birds. If his eyesight wasn't extremely good and his reaction speed being superhuman he might not have been able to dodge the few he came across that were cruising at this altitude. After about 45 minutes he spotted his destination ahead of him and started to slow down which brought back a disorienting amount of noise. Still he safely arrived on the southeastern part of the country and began his search for the spot Slytherin described. This was slightly tricky as there was quite a lot of volcanic activity in the southern part of the country that threw off his magical senses slightly from the earth fire there. After about two hours of careful searching however Nick finally got a magical return that didn't belong to the earth fire. In his senses it felt like something that was trying to go unnoticed which was ironically what gave it away to him. If he was going off of sight or something like that then Slytherin's ward would have worked perfectly as his notice would have slipped right over it but in his magical senses something telling him not to notice it tended to do the opposite. Moving the large amount of rock covering the entrance Nick entered the crevice cautiously after dismantling the ward and replacing it behind him. Like he had expected the crevice was very hot but thanks to both his natural resistance to high temperatures and the armor that adapted and protected him from it he was perfectly fine. Eventually he found his first traces of the metal guardians that Slytherin spoke of in the form of broken pieces of a hole that Nick figured the founder's team had left behind. Chapter 483, Deja Vu Nick picked up the pieces and observed them but frowned as he couldn't identify it. At first glance it appeared to be bronze but it was far too sturdy to actually be it and there was no corrosion at all despite the enchantments on the metal being destroyed for over a thousand years. Using the system Nick analyzed the pieces and smiled at what it told him. The metal was called Olympium and was an alloy created by Hephaestus that the forge god used for most of their intricate works. Even more surprisingly was that the pieces belonged to a magical drone created out of the metal. This raised Nick's hopes greatly that this was indeed the location that Hephaestus was sealed but the possibility that it was just the tomb of a powerful wizard that found the alloy also existed. Knowing this Nick collected as much pieces as he could and continued on his way further into the crevice. The walls got smoother and wider the deeper he went while more and more pieces of drones showed up and Nick had even started to find some more whole constructs. The general body shape he could see for the majority of these drones was vaguely arachnid-like except they had clamps on their front for manipulating things. Nick couldn't quite put his finger on it but something about their shape bothered him, like he should know what they were but at the same time he shouldn't as well. It was a weird sort of deja vu rather than anything actually paradoxical in nature and it was driving him crazy. In the end he could only continue collecting the drones as he went deeper into the stone structure underground. What is this place? There is almost no magic at all besides these drones and even then most of them have long since lost all power or been destroyed. 
if anything this place seems almost entirely mechanical in nature. Nick thought in confusion the more the stone started to look as if it had been carved long ago and inlaid with metal pipes and plating. Even stranger was that he could hear steam moving through the pipes to somewhere further in. There was plenty of traps along the way but again none were magical and most had even been disabled prior to his arrival. Nick pushed open a large set of metal doors that stood in his way further in and for the first time since entering this place found a working drone. This one was different than the others however as it looked almost humanoid if it wasn't for the strange rolling wheels it used to move about and weapon hands. The right hand was a mechanical blade while the left appeared to be a sort of crossbow without a string. Again Nick had a horrible sense that he should know what this was but couldn't for the life of him figure out why. The drone also spotted him and steam rose from the side of its head and it turned violent and raised its crossbow arm to fire a bolt at him. Nick waved his wand creating a shield that stopped the bolt before immediately pointing at the drone immobilis. He spoke and the spell appeared in a flash of blue causing the drone to stiffen in place as it was magically paralyzed. Nick walked over to it at this point and began examining the enchantments on it carefully. They were horribly complex actually as there was a sort of primitive AI that detected race and dictated the actions of the drone as a result as well as a set of tasks that it would need to perform in various scenarios. These enchantments are some else entirely. It's like a form of mechanical life with that last step not being taken to truly make it alive. Even stranger is that it seems to be intentional as well. Nick thought with a deep frown as once again a part of his being was screaming at him that he should know what this is and what made it. Disrumpier. Nick said with a flick of his wrist and the drone lost its enchantment before falling to the ground in perfectly intact pieces that Nick collected to put together again later. Looking around the room Nick saw three other door that went in three different directions so he on a whim chose to take the one to his left. Behind that door was what appeared to be a bedroom to his surprise and had a metal mechanically locked chest, a stone bed, a table with stone chairs and a bookshelf with what looked to be the remains of books on it. The books were sadly reduced to fragments and Nick felt like maybe the repair charm might hopefully fix them. Chapter 484, Dwumer. A slash N, this, means missing text. Reparo. He spoke softly and the magic struck the haphazard pile of book remains and Nick watched hopeful that he could learn something about whoever built this place. It was slow going but eventually the magic finished running its course and Nick sighed at what he saw. The few books that were able to be salvaged to a degree were repaired to that and degree and not a big one either. Whatever. Something is better than nothing he thought as he started looking at the script written on the parts of the paper that was legible. Strange lands I have arrived at after, it's been, days since I arrived in this place and I have made several discoveries that, I recently had a run in with the local race of men in this world and diplomacy fell through as we don't speak the same language, drastic measures need to be taken to rectify this. That was all that was understandable in the first book and Nick made an inference based on the context clues written within these scant few lines. This was that whoever constructed this place was not from this world which was shocking. He had long theorized that it was entirely possible to travel to other realities after he himself had done so after he died but from his understanding it was extremely difficult to do while alive. Souls he had found were more energy than anything else so it took much less effort to send this energy to another place compared to a physical body well attuned to its world. Unfortunately these books were in terrible condition and as a result were lacking the details Nick needed to try and figure out how this person got here from wherever they came from. Moving on to the next book Nick found a reference that he recognized and he finally understood why he had been having such a bad case of deja vu. After scrying this entire world I have come to a startling conclusion, there are no mare here nor didra, my realization of finding myself in an entirely new reality has lead to a sense of dread setting in, I am truly alone. That was the only legible entry in the second book and it told Nick exactly what wrote the entry and where they came from, Edmer from Nirn was in this world at some point. This was an earth-shattering discovery as the implications behind such a thing was insane for various reasons. It was a well-recorded fact that the Dmer were basically all mad scientist types with little regard for other races being contempt and disdain. It was so bad in fact that the leader of them in a single part of the world went so far as trying to forcefully elevate the entire race to divinity rather than try and make peace with their enemies. This arrogant act caused nearly the entire race to go extinct as they zero-summed from existence. Nick had a burning desire to know if this particular Dmer arrived in this world because of that act or if they had come to this world before that point somehow. Both possibilities came with their own implications and weight but both were different. If the Dmer came as a result of Kagranak's folly them it was also possible that others of that race or even the majority of that race had been translocated to different realities. If the Dmer came via other means however it means there may be the key knowledge to dimensional travel somewhere in this place. I don't know exactly when this person arrived on earth but I assume it was either after the gods died off or sealed themselves away or the gods never noticed them for some reason. 
Nick thought seriously before moving to the next book. An astounding discovery. I have managed to leech off the magicka of the object to power my home I. The seals still hold tight but I shall persevere to discover what secret they hide from me. I am dying, I almost didn't realize it but my magicka is consuming me to maintain itself slowly, I, weakness in my bones as I write this last entry. So this person seems to have arrived after the gods vanished and was being tier 4 but not by much. Nick noted after he finished the book. Unfortunately even using the repair charm again and again did nothing to recover the lost texts which left him with many questions and no answers. He was hopeful however as there was mention of seals which means a god might still be here. With that in mind Nick left the room and walked to the door to the right of the center hallway slash room and pushed it open. Chapter 485, Lexicon Immediately after opening the door Nick leapt backwards as several attacks came at him from within the room. He didn't realize it until the door was opened but there was three drones within the room set to ambush whoever opened it incorrectly. I forgot that the Dmer were clever pricks and did shit like this he thought as he quickly immobilized and dismantled the drones like the previous one. Even if the Dmer who made them was tier 5 or higher the drones themselves were simple constructions that were only a true threat to a wizard like Nick if he was caught off guard. That was because the things lacked any real magical means of attacking and relied on physical means to cause damage. Even worse was that they had no resistance to this world's form of magic at all that wasn't so focused on destruction as opposed to utility. For all the gifts the people of Nirn had with their thriving mana-rich world they sucked at getting creative with their spells and tended to rely on brute force for everything. While Nick can't say that was wrong it just meant that this world's magic system had an edge in utility and finesse by a wide margin. The Dmer themselves likely wasn't aware of this at the time they created these drones and thus simply chose to stick to the traditional automatons of their race. Nick chuckled and shook his head at this before focusing on the task at hand. Walking into the room he smiled as how could he not recognize a workshop when he saw one? The whole room was well preserved thanks to the type metal used for the tools and the enchantments on everything that stopped time's ravages. Oh yes the room was absolutely blinding to Nick's magical senses as the whole place had preservative enchantments on them that he recognized as being written in Didric runes. He wasn't surprised at this since most enchantments from Nirn used the language as a base for their enchantments and spellcraft. And why wouldn't they Windadra and Dra were the constant and ever-present reminder of the most powerful beings in their reality, that they were aware of anyways. Even calling it Didric runes was technically incorrect as it belonged to the Dra as well though to be fair the Didra were the first to share the knowledge of the language with the mortal races. Hermias Mora to be precise was the one responsible for the spread of that knowledge to the mortals. Nick had to admit it was a smart move of the Prince of Secrets and Fate's part as it was a foregone conclusion that the mortal races would get that knowledge eventually on their own so why not skip the hassle and get it over with in exchange for some profit for himself? The funny part in Nick's opinion was that the Didric Lord clearly hadn't realized exactly how far the mortals would take that piece of knowledge at the time. The Dmer more than any other race proved their hegemony in the usage of the language as they made false life and even tapped into tonal magic which was a whole complicated and super high tier piece of magic. The crazy race even got uncomfortably close to creating a new god using the heart of one as a fuel source. Nick was frankly speaking thrilled with the workshop's discovery as even without the knowledge of the one who made it he could at the very least copy the enchantments and then figure out bits and pieces of how the Dmer crafted stuff. The biggest gain however was an apple-sized metal cube looking object that had sat in a special pedestal in the center of the workshop. A lexicon, nice. Nick thought excitedly since he knew that the things were used by the Dmer as a sort of portable library for knowledge. This one was obviously empty as it had no magical signals at all but with some luck Nick could use it to reverse engineer the magical technology behind it for his own use. This would be a huge step forward for him as using this technology he could inscribe an entire library's worth of knowledge onto a lexicon that could then be directly injected into his mind to instantly gain all of it. It wasn't exactly learning that fast so much as allowing him to directly skip the reading step of gaining knowledge and letting him work on directly memorizing it all instead. He wasn't the only one who would benefit from this technology either as he could inscribe the entire Hogwarts library into a lexicon and have all of it injected into the first years of the school to basically elevate the entire British wizarding community's future generation's knowledge and power by a wide margin. Chapter 486, The Crystal and Its Guardian Snapping himself out of his wondrous fantasies Nick took out one of his many blank journals and began copying the enchantments on literally every part of the room from the tools to the furniture all of it was copied down exactly as it was seen. The Dmer had thought themselves clever and made sure that the enchantments on the tools were all vague and bound permanently to themselves so they were useless to anyone else but Nick had no intention of preserving the enchantments at all. He could get better versions from the system and enchant them himself so his only use for the tools was the material they were made from. 
Speaking of said material Nick couldn't figure out how the Dwemer had gotten so much to begin with that it could be used as mere decoration for this place beyond the drones and tools. The stuff was literally all over the place and Nick found this odd since it made no sense. As an unnaturally created alloy the metal should be in short supply yet the Dwemer seemed to have more than they knew what to do with. Perhaps I'll find out why by going deeper into the complex he thought after packing up the whole room's contents into the realm. Leaving the now empty room Nick finally chose to go through the middle door that to no surprise had a long downward sloping hallway behind it. Like the rest of the Dwemer ruin the hallway was made of stone and metal with pipes along its sides. There were also a few traps here and there that Nick spotted and easily avoided by floating over them with his armor. Obviously the Dwemer had never expected a flying intruder when they made the traps so they were entirely ineffective against Nick. The hallway went on and on for nearly an hour of slowly floating down it as the temperature gradually grew greater and greater. Finally Nick made it to the huge set of heavily enchanted and locked doors that he assumed contained the final part of the ruin. Dear gods that is an insane amount of protection. Clearly that Dwemer did not want anyone to see what is behind this door. Nick thought with conflicting emotions about it. On one hand he was impressed by the defenses while on the other they irritated him for being such a pain to get past. Anti-magic protection enchantments galore and no less than three super complicated puzzle locks that didn't have any context to them at all. Two days, it took Nick two whole days to figure out the combinations for the locks and finally open the doors. Even then he only figured them out by trying literally every possible combination until he got the right ones. It was all worth it in his opinion however as he finally pushed open the doors and saw what lay beyond them. A vast lake of molten metal that had Dumer constructs attached to it and in the very center a huge crystalline structure that sent chills down his spine. Not from its appearance but because of the sheer quality and quantity of mana contained within it that passively seeped out in tiny amounts. Deific presence confirmed, now to ignore my instincts and try and figure out which god it is. Nick thought seriously as he moved to try and float over the metal lake. The key word there was try as the moment he approached the lake it moved as something started to surface from below it. First came a reptilian head with well visible fangs that were each nearly twice the size of Nick himself at the minimum. It had huge bronze colored scales with jagged edges on its neck down alongside long thick black horns from behind its skull and a massive bulky body like that of a monitor lizard but scaled up to the point of being nearly the size of an entire football field. The creature didn't have wings but it didn't need them for Nick to know what it was, a dragon. You wouldn't happen to know how to talk would you? Nick asked hoping to avoid conflict with the monstrous creature if possible. That hope was K-LLED brutally as the dragon opened its mouth and unleashed a torrent of golden-colored flames at Nick. He wasted no time at all shooting to the side as fast as his armor would let him barely avoiding the flames that covered a huge area. Obscuro. Nick called as he used the blinding curse to try and take away the dragon's vision which was a highly recommended move against the creatures. The hide of a dragon is ridiculously resistant to magic and only the eyes were vulnerable normally so removing that sense was a no-brainer when dealing with one. Nick was pretty sure that this dragon in particular would prove to be a pain to defeat considering where it was living. Chapter 487, Fighting the Dragon It would take an idiot to not realize that this dragon was leeching off the mana that radiated from the crystal and saturated the molten metal of the lake. Nick was no idiot and could easily recognize this fact and sigh as he shot around the huge cavern's airspace to avoid the dragon's attacks. To make matters worse Nick's senses told him a fact about the dragon that had him conflicted about K-Ling the beast as well it was tier 5. Not the weak sort of tier 5 either like Slytherin who hadn't gone beyond the entry point of that tier but full on solidly within the tier. Nick was conflicted about K asterisk-ling the creature because he was well aware that this could very well be the only tier 5 dragon on the entire planet and was an entirely unknown species to boot. Simply K asterisk-ling such a thing for his own convenience when it wasn't strictly necessary just didn't sit right with him. Boom. A blast of flame on a nearby wall said that the dragon itself had no such issues about K asterisk-ling him however as it wildly attacked after the blinding spell took hold. One might be wondering how Nick wasn't already dead against the dragon if it was two whole tiers above him and this would be a good question if it was a wizard. Magical beasts however functioned differently than wizards and other intelligent species such as goblin when it came to tiers of power. A normal dragon was actually tier 4 on average which means they should be as strong as Dumbledore and yet they could be restrained by even tier 2 wizards with the right strategy. The reason for this was because while their power and mana levels were well into tier 4 they were basically just great big brutes that lacked the versatility and minds required to fully utilize this power like wizards do. To put it bluntly this dragon while powerful was just flinging around its power without any direction or restraint at all which was of course dangerous but only if Nick was an idiot and let it hit him. 
Despite their lack of intelligence dragons weren't stupid beasts by any means so it didn't take long for this one to realize that Nick couldn't be gotten in this way and switch up tactics. To be specific Nick watched it dive back under the molten metal of the lake and vanish from his magical senses. It couldn't be helped as the molten metal was constantly radiating mana from the crystal that cut off his perception at the surface of the lake. This made Nick vigilant as he knew that this meant that the beast could try and ambush him from beneath the metal. To prevent any accidents he flew to the top of the cavern and summoned a double-layered shield charm as he watched the molten metal for any signs of movement. It was hard to tell what was movement from the dragon and what was the natural flow of the molten metal until the spot right below him sank downwards noticeably and he shot to the side just in time to avoid a blast of flame directed at his previous position. He didn't escape entirely unharmed however as his left foot got hit by the edge of the attack and was horribly scorched as a result. TSSSS He hissed in pain and grit his teeth to stop himself from screaming and tried to maintain his focus on surviving and defeating this dragon. I can heal the damage later if I survive that long. He thought seriously as he never stopped moving to prevent another attack like that. This clearly got the dragon impatient as it began to visibly chase him from beneath the metal causing large amounts of disturbances on the surface as it did so. Glaces. Nick said loudly and a dense amount of icy air shot out of his wand towards the molten lake below and struck it in a wide area ray a a a a a a The dragon screamed in anger and pain as the hyper cold air clashed with the hyper hot metal and more importantly dragon beneath it. What happens when a super hot material is rapidly cooled? If you thought it becomes brittle and rigid then you are correct and this sudden chemistry lesson was learned by the dragon as well. The frigid magic struck its scorching hide and caused it to crack and peel apart as it was moving a lot and thus created a nasty looking wound on its back. Nyx attacked it as intended however and forced the beast to the surface to keep the molten metal from damaging its exposed flesh. While the dragon was clearly adapted to living in the molten lake that only really applied if its hide was fully intact which thanks to Nick was no longer the case. Chapter 488, Taming a Dragon, Sorta. Mistakes have been made. Nick thought as the dragon went from casually trying to murder him to wanting to obliterate him after his attack landed. Dragons were wrathful creatures to begin with so it came as no surprise to Nick that this one was absolutely livid at the moment. If it wasn't for his advantage in speed he might really be in trouble as the beast was quite literally snapping at his heels as it tried to k-lll him. One thing Nick had noticed however was that the beast was also careful not to strike the crystal structure in the center of the lake whenever they got close to it despite its anger. Nick noticed this and took advantage of it to constantly pelt the dragon's exposed flesh with knockout charms that were starting to take hold of it. Nick had to admit that if this was a normal dragon he would have likely long since had restrained it but this one was stupidly sturdy and resistant to spells. Nearly 30 full power knockout spells straight into its body and all that had accomplished was to make the creature a little drowsy but still going strong. Fuck it I tried playing nice time to go for the mean methods. Nick thought in frustration and pointed his wand at the beast. Legilimens. He spoke firmly and the dragon froze as Nick's mind probe violently smashed into its natural shielding and pierced through them. Dusk had been Nick's legilimency partner for quite some time now and despite its naturally powerful shields had also been rapidly improving in them as it fended Nick off. Compared to defenses like that this dragon's natural defenses were laughably easy for Nick to bust through. That was when Nick discovered something he hadn't even considered until now, this was not always a dragon. It was deep within the mind space and was suppressed heavily but there was memories that belonged to something that was obviously not a beast. The Dwemer. Nick realized in astonishment and understanding. He had wondered how this dragon had gotten down here in the first place and now he knew. It was included in some of the Dwemer's last coherent memories before the beast's mind suppressed it and took control again. In a desperate bid for survival the Dwemer captured a pack of stone-scale dragons which had lived nearby this area on the surface. Using forbidden life-altering rituals and alchemical solutions the Dwemer bred the beasts into an entirely new species that could survive for thousands of years while living within the molten metal. The Dwemer then used another forbidden ritual to transfer their mind and soul into an egg in such a way that they could basically control this new body to survive without losing any of their power. The mind and soul fusion were successful however it soon became clear that the Dwemer had miscalculated as they hadn't realized that the minds and souls of the creatures were naturally extremely powerful. The final result was that the mind and soul of the Dwemer was subsumed by the dragons instead of the other way around while all the Dwemer's power still went to the newborn beast. Nick sighed at this while creating false memories in the beast's mind to make it think that it has known him for many many years and this was merely one of their spars for supremacy and not a fight to the death. Fights between dragons for supremacy rarely actually ended in death since there was no one to rule over if you k lll all of them. It was a bit like the hierarchy system of a pride of lions except that the younger dragons weren't k lled off challenging their hordes alphas. 
Nick left the beast's mind and waited vigilantly as its mind adjusted to his tampering. There was a few ways this could go truthfully with some being positive and the others being not so positive. Thankfully the memories were accepted since they didn't clash too heavily with the beast's instincts and true memories. The dragon's gaze changed from hostility to a sort of fond irritation at its loss from the spar dot. The only reason Nick was even able to make such a change was that thanks to the Dwemer's memories and soul the dragon technically understood speech. Thus Nick had a way to communicate with it in reality as it would clash far too much if the dragon only understood body language and roars yet had memories of conversing with him. This was a unique situation that would only work in this particular scenario alone and Nick was very much aware of it. Chapter 489, Sneaky Dwemer don't be mistaken into believing that the dragon was anything but a wild force of nature even after Nick's mental tampering as the beast by no means would obey him unconditionally. In fact if he ever showed up in front of it in a poor shape it was likely to try and usurp his dominant position in the relationship. The same was also true if it felt like it was able to defeat him at any given point in time. Nick while tempted to dive into the Dwemer's memories to try and steal its knowledge didn't do so because he was very much aware that this would disrupt the balance of the dragon and Dwemer's position in the same mind. Just the small glimpse he saw told Nick that the Dwemer was not the sort of being he wanted to truly take control of the dragon's body. It was extremely self-centered, arrogant and had a clear disregard for all that could be considered forbidden or dark magic. Something like that at Tier 5 with all its knowledge would almost definitely become a problem in the future after learning that it was leagues more powerful than most magical beings on the planet. How could the Dwemer not figure that out after Nick read the entries that it had written that stated it had scanned the entire planet already? No. Rather than run the risk of the Dwemer's mind taking over by diving through its memories Nick chose to leave the dragon in charge for now. Anyways after the spar the dragon swam to the shore of the molten lake to start recovering from its wounds while ignoring Nick since according to it he was not out of place at all. Nick on the other hand flew to the far side of the molten lake and pressed on a stone that looked normal at first glance. After pressing it however the rock wall shuddered and rumbled as it opened up to reveal the hidden room that the Dwemer used to store the other members of the dragon species in stasis alongside all the ritual circles and knowledge it had in a lexicon pedestal. Like all Dwemer this one simply hated the idea of its knowledge getting lost in case there was an accident or it died and thus stored all it knew in this pedestal. Of course this all required a blank lexicon to be inscribed in the first place and only contained pure knowledge without any experiences or personal findings like the Dwemer's memories held. Luckily for Nick he had picked up a raw lexicon from the ruins earlier and thus set it in place and hit the button to start the inscribing process. Under the scrutiny of his magical senses Nick understood how the Dwemer did it and couldn't help but admit that it was ingenious. See the lexicons were actually not the key to this method of storing information but rather merely the chosen medium that the Dwemer used for it. The true key was actually the pedestal itself that shot out microscopic lasers of mana that quite literally burned the pre-programmed information into the medium's surface and core. It was super high concept stuff that the wizarding world probably would never come up with on its own as it was just so far away from it that it wasn't even funny. And I actually thought that I could replicate this with merely a lexicon, what a joke. Nick thought with a sigh. Soon enough the lexicon was finished being inscribed and Nick could see the huge amount of mana contained within the thing. Millions of microscopic runes covered the lexicon and waited for someone to use their mana to read the information they held. Nick didn't do that since he was on a bit of a timeline and there was clearly not a small amount of information within the lexicon. Instead Nick stored the lexicon within the realm and turned his attention to the specimens that were kept under stasis via circles that fed off the mana present in the air to power a sort of temporal field. Of course the Dwemer fucked with time, because absolutely nothing is off limits to these crazy bastards apparently. Nick complained mentally. Some topics were forbidden for a reason and time definitely fell on that list strictly because of the horrible things that could happen by messing with it. A good example was how the grandfather paradox solved itself after someone put it to the test with a time turner. A person went back about four generations and K asterisk LLED their ancestor which caused time to decide that the person's entire family after that point to simply zero sum out of existence beyond the records outside of time held by the ministry. Chapter 490, Divine Crystal Needless to say Nick was very hesitant to touch the subject because while he knew for a fact multiverse theory was correct he would rather not find out what happens if you successfully fuck with your own timeline too much. That said cancelling the temporal stasis field was a piece of cake as Nick merely scratched out the mana drawing runes and watched as the circle rapidly depoward as it burned through its fuel. It was interesting to see the small but adult dragons in the cages go from still frame to slowly moving as time resumed for them. Well small compared to the huge beast out in the molten lake but still about the size of an elephant so large in truth. Nick counted and there was 30 adults, 15 juveniles, and 20 unhatched eggs in total. 
really seemed to like the number five it seems he thought with a chuckle after he was done counting the creatures. Unlike the dragon out in the molten lake that had been living freely its entire life these ones were born and raised under the thumb of the Dwemer so remained well behaved despite seeing Nick. Going through the creature's memories Nick discovered why too as the Dwemer was a cruel master that punished any disobedience harshly and rewarded obedience lightly. The punishments were agonizing torture and the rewards were slightly more or better food and the privilege to breed. Nick was disgusted by this and and released the creatures from their cages and into the molten lake after placing himself firmly as their alpha. The huge dragon in the lake was not bothered at all by this as the new additions to the environment immediately submitted to it. The eggs however were a different story for Nick as he stored them in his realm. Hagrid will likely be thrilled to take care of them until they hatch but I'll have to check with Dumbledore if that will be alright first. If nothing else these little ones will help set up a stable population of this species. Nick thought after he stored the eggs away. Despite being an engineered species by the Dwemer the dragons were originally part of a species that truly existed but had gone extinct from overhunting so most magi zoologists would be thrilled to see them return in some way. Nick obviously knew that publicly coming out and saying that he discovered them wouldn't sit well with the order since it would definitely draw attention to them again as those in the know would seek them out to learn where Nick found the dragons. This was where Dumbledore came into play as the old man could go on a short trip without anyone knowing and come back while saying that he discovered the species. The really tricky part was getting a decent sized population set up and removing them from the molten lake and into the original habitat. Dot. There was no way in hell Nick was going to let anyone near the Dwemer ruin and even less of a chance the molten lake with the crystal he suspected contained a god. It doesn't even matter that the huge dragon could fend off most wizards easily as if they somehow caused the seal on the crystal to come undone the god within is likely to be pissed from basically being k asterisk LLED by curious ants as there was no way a god could survive for long with the current mana levels of the world. So moving the dragons to a new place and then having them be accidentally discovered by Dumbledore was the best option. Nick was satisfied with his haul on this trip and left the hidden room behind him after emptying it off everything he was interested in. Floating about the molten lake Nick approached the crystal which got him watched closely by the huge dragon resting on the molten lake's shore. Nick ignored that however as he closed his eyes and focused on his magical senses as he closely observed the crystal. It was hard to notice but the longer he observed the more horrified he was at what he found. An uncountable number of runes were all layered on top of each other and through each other in a massive spell formation that had solidified around something of immense power to stop the effects of time on it until a condition was fulfilled. The real horror however came from the discovery that the molten lake was created exclusively from the minute amounts of that the immense power's mana that leaked. In simple terms the metal was created out of pure energy in defiance of the laws of reality on accident. Is this the true meaning of divinity? To create matter from nothing by simply existing. Nick pondered in shock. Chapter 491, Dread Nick had always assumed that the gods like Zeus were basically just massively upgraded forms of wizards but this was now proven to be massively incorrect. Not only incorrect but a huge underestimation as well. I thought I was making good progress to being able to fend off Zeus but how the hell am I supposed to fight something like this? Nick panicked mentally as the realization set in that he was very far from even being a threat to Zeus. Calm yourself no good will come of panic. You could not have known of this aspect until now so you could not plan around it, now you can. Celebrimber counseled wisely. It should not be forgotten that despite being most well known as a smith Celebrimber was a warrior and a tactician for long before he even picked up a hammer. A damn good one as well to the point it was the literal second thing that history remembered him for. Nick was well aware of this fact himself which let him calm down greatly after the elf spoke. The key points in any conflict is information. SK asterisk LL and preparations. If you have enough time to gather these in plenty then no foe can truly defeat you without exceeding you in the same. The elf lord said seriously. What plan can I even make in the face of this though? The most dangerous thing I can create is rendered moot in the face of this power. Nick asked heavily demoralized. While it is true that you can not make adequate preparations to counter your foe at this point that is no reason to believe you can not in the future. Need I remind you that your growth in power has been rapid and strong. Celebrimber spoke firmly. That knowledge helped Nick to fully calm himself and focus on trying to gather information about divinity from the crystal. It was a slow process as all he he study was the tiny amounts of mana that was released from the crystal before they turned into metal. Though from what Nick did learn over the next few days before he had no choice but to return to Hogwarts even calling it mana was wrong. The basic structure of the energy was the same but it was fundamentally different from the stuff Nick had come to accept as a part of his everyday life. It was hard to describe for Nick as while it confirmed a few of his theories about what the higher tiers of power were like it left him with many more questions than answered. 
For example the mana was qualitatively superior than anything Nick could have even considered possible like it had been broken down into its purest form before strengthened many fold to almost be an entirely different type of energy. Even stranger was that the energy seemed to have innate properties to itself that didn't seem unnatural at all but like they were meant to be there. This was what caused the energy to turn into metal from what Nick could tell but besides a theory that this was something innate to divinity Nick had no clue what he was even looking at. This left him confused and frustrated when he finally returned to Hogwarts the day before the students were due to come back. Bloody hell mate, where have you been this whole time? I looked all over the castle but couldn't find you at all. Ron questioned curiously after Nick went to dinner. Hmm? Iceland, had a bit of an errand to take care of there is all. Nick said casually. Ron and the rest of the people at the table listening to the conversation all had dumbfounded looks. Buddy, pal, greatest ringmaker ever. How in Merlin's name did you even get to Iceland and back in less than a week? Fred asked with overflowing curiosity. The rest of the people listening to the conversation were also dying to learn this as well. It wasn't even that hard really, only took about an hour to get there by flight for me. Nick said with a shrug. You had to be going faster than sound to get there in less than an hour. L.E. Jordan exclaimed in shock. Contrary to popular opinion Greyfinder students weren't actually stupid and Lee Jordan was especially outstanding in terms of mental acumen and had easily figured out the distance between here and Iceland and by extension how fast you would need to go to get there in under an hour. Nick wasn't even surprised about it as the boy had to be fast thinking to accurately keep up with a Quidditch and Blitzball game given the amount of things going on at once during one. Chapter 492, Seeking Growth That is correct yes. Nick said nodding in agreement. How did you even get a broom to fly that fast, no wait, why did you get one to go that fast? Lee asked curiously. First I didn't use a broom. Second does it matter all that much? Like I very much doubt any of you are going to make a similar trip anytime soon and even if you were there are better methods anyways like continental port keys. Nick said bluntly. Everyone went silent as they realized he had a point as it really was unlikely that they needed to leave the country anytime soon and that port keys were in fact a better method. Wait a sec, did you say you didn't use a broom? Seamus asked after noticing this detail. That is what I said yes, why? Nick said casually. Please tell me you didn't use my dad's car. Ron said with a look of panic. Nick scoffed that piece of junk was taken by the ministry and even if it wasn't it was horribly inefficient and sloppily enchanted which made sense considering your dad was merely tinkering with it to begin with. No I merely enchanted a piece of equipment to allow me to fly without the constraints of a broom. He explained honestly. It didn't matter if he told them about this enchantment as unless he chose to sell it publicly the information was nearly useless to know. Nick can fly? Cool can you? No? Then how the hell is knowing it useful at all? Besides making people jealous knowing that Nick didn't need a broom to fly served no real purpose. Everyone also realized this after the twins asked for such an enchanted object and Nick denied them without any hesitation. Once it became clear that Nick wasn't going to share his flight enchantment the conversation shifted to what Nick went to Iceland for. All he told them was that he had read about something that was found and hidden away there in the past and he decided to go treasure hunting for it while he had the time. This was entirely true even if he left out a few key details that would have made it clear that this was no simple matter. When asked what he found Nick refused to answer and left it up to their imaginations after merely stating that it was a profitable trip. He wasn't lying either as merely the drones he had recovered would have proven valuable and worthwhile for the trip much less everything else he found as well. A bunch of high potential dragon eggs, the knowledge of the Dwemer recorded on the lexicon and extremely valuable data regarding divinity not to mention the vast amount of powerful metal he had gotten while he was there made the entire trip extremely profitable. Still despite that Nick chose to immediately vanish from the school instead of relaxing as he now knew roughly how large a gap he had to cover in order to face Zeus was. Well it wasn't exactly accurate to say he vanished from the school so much as went to a part of it that no one else was aware of in the form of Slytherin's library. Nick was about halfway done with the library and he wanted to finish the rest as soon as possible so he could begin deciphering the lexicon's knowledge while he improved his power via rituals and elixirs. The funny part was that Nick knew of one such ritual that would likely cause his power to instantly jump many tiers at once but like all such things came with a very high price. The ritual of maturation was a dreadful thing that was created by wizards of old in order to accelerate the physical and magical maturation of a young wizard thus skipping the growth period entirely. This sounded good at first glance until you understood the price needed to achieve such a thing. First was obviously that the body and magic might mature but the mind and soul did not thus creating a child in an adult body. 
The second issue however was that one needed to sacrifice twice the time it would have normally been for this maturation in terms of lifespan. To simplify if you matured the child it was used on the full 7 year growth period that child instead loses 14 years off their total lifespan. For Nick this isn't a problem since his lifespan is endless as elves stop aging after reaching maturity unless they choose otherwise. No the issue for him comes in the form of stunted potential as whatever gains he would have gotten through natural maturity beyond his natural magic growth would be rendered null as he obviously wouldn't have them since he skipped years of maturation. Chapter 493, Finishing Slytherin's Legacy This is not to say Nick wouldn't grow stupidly powerful through the ritual but that his SK asterisk LL and knowledge would be massively out of sync with it which would hold him back for likely even longer than if he studied and matured normally. The final drawback however was the one that had Nick classify the ritual as an absolute final resort type deal. To put it simply this ritual corrupts the soul due to how against nature it is which was a huge problem for Nick. He used his soul for nearly every facet of the Celebrimber style and even required soul purity to use ballad enchantments to their fullest potential. With this understood Nick would never utilize this ritual unless he felt like the power boost was his only course of action. He was well aware that his natural maturation alone would likely place him at tier 5 or maybe even 6 due to the extreme rate of growth it had so he wasn't too worried about becoming powerful as in time it was practically guaranteed. What he wanted was to reach his full potential however so despite having great power as a future guarantee he sought ways to truly squeeze out every ounce of bonus growth he could before he matured and his magical growth slowed to a snail's pace. The first half of Slytherin's library was written about his formative years and early adulthood so lacked any grand feats of magic or powerful spell work. Nick could easily see the transition as he memorized the contents of the library from simple to complex magical knowledge. Entire tomes on metaphysical phenomena and medical magics that would make any modern medi which faint in shock. Salazar was thorough in every single detail of his life as far as Nick could see from his reading until one historically important event, meeting Godric Greyfinder. An interesting fact that most ignore is that the founders' last names were specifically chosen by the founders themselves and that they either lacked any last name or forsook the one they had originally for their chosen one. Salazar for example came from the noble name of Bohun but forsook it for Slytherin due to how noble he considered snakes. The other founders had chosen similarly as him with the exception of Hufflepuff that was apparently a joke name by Helga that stuck. Ironically the Salazar and Godric didn't meet under the best of conditions originally but rather were competing over the contents of an ancient wizard's tomb. Even Slytherin himself made no attempt to sugarcoat the situation as pleasant but directly stated that it was a outright magical slugfest that both men walked away from in horrible condition. Cheap tricks and terrible curses from Slytherin seeking to quickly end the battle and powerful blunt force charms and transfigurations from Greyfinder that sought supremacy through pure power clashed to destructive and terrible effect. Salazar lost this particular bout and needed to flee miserably though not before leaving a large amount of painful sounding curses on Godric. The two funnily enough couldn't seem to stay away from each other as they met and clashed many more times after that with mixed results as sometimes Salazar won and sometimes Godric did. Still through this they developed an odd sort of respect and eventually straight up friendship. Along the way Rowena and Helga joined the group as they sought powerful and reliable allies until under the suggestion of Helga and Godric Hogwarts was founded to end the era of wandering wizards and dark magic. Nick learned a great many things over the next two months after he dropped out of enchanting since he had patched up his skewed understanding of the topic. This only left him with divination so he only attended a single class a week before devoting the rest of his time to Slytherin's library. Thanks to this Nick finally finished it upright at the 28th of February. A day later the abomination finally made landfall once again and it was time to see if the space looping trap would work. Nick was summoned to Dumbledore's office when the time came and the old goat had out a large crystal ball that Nick immediately spotted contained an enchantment to show the surrounding of another crystal ball wherever it may be. If you are here then how will the trap be sprung? Nick asked with a frown. Nico has graciously volunteered to stay at the edge of the formation to complete it and fuel it once the creature enters the center of it. Here is the hag's tone box you asked for by the way. The old man said seriously as he brought of a small grey jewelry box from his robe's inner pocket. Chapter 494, Trapped The creature was boiling in anger by the time it finally landed on the shore as it cut a sorry figure with nearly no muscles and dark bags under its sunburnt skin. Without a steady source of magic to feed off of the creature had resorted to self-consumption as well as the sporadic meal in the form of foolish magical creatures that it ran across to maintain its existence. This caused the creature to truly appear like a walking skeleton with dark cracked skin stretched over it and sunken eyes that radiated madness and wrath. The witch or wizard holding the viewing orb from the sky allowed Nick to see this grotesque scene through the ball in Dumbledore's office. Honestly I am pretty sure it's close to death already so maybe just shooting it would finish it off. 
Nick said with a frown. Something about this bothered him, like it was just way too easy for the level of danger the creature should hold. Indeed though I admit the Ministry has not helped the matter for the creature by diverting most magical beast away from its path. Dumbledore said calmly. Ah. I see, so that's why it seems too easy. The creature has been starved more than I expected thanks to the Ministry's efforts. Nick said while nodding in understanding. Observe, it's starting. Dumbledore said firmly and they both observed the ball intensely. The view panned out and for a long distance away they could see several stones light up and a silvery-looking barrier spread out from each stone connecting until it formed a massive dome with the creature in the center. The dome then turned transparent and from within it an odd scene was playing out. The creature seemed to feel that something wrong as it shot forward inhumanly fast only to look like it lagged for a moment before appearing on the opposite side of the dome it was just it. It apparently didn't realize that this happened immediately and kept sprinting forward only to end up opposite the previous location again. It hasn't panicked yet so we don't know if the trap withhold quite yet but it looks promising. Nick said honestly and Dumbledore nodded. Soon however the abomination figured out what was happening and opened its mouth in what appeared to be a horrible wail. A wave of pure destruction radiated from the creature in all directions evaporating everything from stone to the very air itself as nothing was spared. Thankfully the trap managed to contain this power and even forced the creature to cease its attack as the spatial loop sent the attack back at it. Once the bright magic vanished Nick could see that all that was left was a perfectly smooth bowl-shaped hole with the creature falling infinitely from the top of the dome to the bottom before falling from the sky again. The creature flailed desperately and sent all manner of attacks flying as it fell before in the end collapsing in on itself as its magic cannibalized its very existence. It was a slow and gruesome end to witness and neither Nick or Dumbledore dared to look away since they were the ones that set this in motion and thus were determined to witness it to the finish. Leave the formation up for a month before lowering it. Keep the box as I will clearly not need it. Nick said seriously before leaving the office deep in thought. During this event he had witnessed several unique and unknown forms of magic from the abomination and he wished to learn what they were and how they were done. The most important was the wave of pure destruction that seemed to erase matter in a stable manner that seemed directly to be the antithesis to divine mana that created matter from nothing. Nick knew that the abomination likely used it instinctually and didn't understand what it was doing but it still inspired him. He didn't know what it was called or even what the requirements to use were but Nick did know that he wanted it. He was hopeful that it would allow him to counter divine mana to a degree. Generally from what Nick could tell magic was extremely balanced in that typically the counter to something was usually on the same level it was but there were a few exceptions. The most well known was the fiend fire curse that could be countered with magical intent in a protego shield. The evil flame seeks to devour everything and yet if sealed within a barrier infused with the wizard's willpower it is stopped somehow despite clearly being higher grade. Chapter 495, Mistaken Assumptions Nick wasted no time at all searching the system for any book on the subject of whatever the abomination used but found only a single work on it that was way out of his price range at a whopping 500 million points. Nick was not surprised at the price or that the knowledge was so rare either as it was obviously extremely high tier and also the sort of thing no one in their right mind would try and learn. From what Nick could tell the magic was basically pure destruction given form to the point of erasing matter itself. Something like that definitely couldn't be controlled with any real level of precision meaning it only took a split-second mistake to see yourself erased from existence. With a sigh Nick closed out the system since it was pointless to keep looking at the tome on the subject if he couldn't afford it. Instead he headed to the library to see if he could find the information on the blood curse that the Greengrass family suffered from. First he checked the ancient section to see if it was there and only after a few hours searching he found what he was looking for. It turned out that Nick's theory about the curse not originally being meant to be a curse was correct as according to the information he found the original creator noticed the steadily decreasing power of the pure blood bloodlines and wanted to forcefully correct this problem. And this is why false assumptions are the bane of people's attempts. Nick thought with a disapproving look at the method behind the person's spell work. The person assumed that the key to the bloodline's power was in fact within the blood which was obviously incorrect. Nick was well aware that the bloodlines mere set the body up to be able to host the power inherited but after that point the blood in one's body had little to do with it anymore. The magic circuits were where the true key to that power was and the reason for the decreasing power of the pure bloods was because of their generationally atrophying circuits as they tried to coast off their ancestors' glory and effort without any themselves. Besides the false assumption though the creator of the curse correctly did their work and the curse did affect one's bloodline in a small but otherwise generally positive way. The issue came in the form of the fact that the magic was incorrectly founded and thus horribly flawed which caused the spell to turn from a blessing to a powerful hereditary curse. There was no more information after that point besides a warning to never try and use this spell on yourself as it will only k asterisk lll you instead. 
considering the sudden change in handwriting I assume that the end was written by the creator's apprentice or relative. Nick thought while shaking his head. It was pretty easy to understand why that was the case too since the creator likely got overzealous and used the spell on themselves. Well at least it is easy to fix now that I know this information. You just need to channel the curse from the blood to the magical core so that it actually does what it was intended to. Nick thought with an odd expression. Despite a plethora of medi witches trying to crack the green grass curse none had succeeded now despite the solution being very simple to accomplish. To be fair to them though they all operated off the premise that the curse was entirely meant to be a negative thing like most curses which stopped them from making progress on it ironically. Till now all they could do was treat the symptoms of the curse to extend the bearer's life and try and make them more comfortable before the curse eventually claimed them. Time to give this method to Madame Pomfrey then. Nick thought as he left the library. He quickly placed a powerful disillusionment charm on himself as well as a notice-me-not charm to keep the perceptive Medi-Witch from finding him as he approached the hospital wing. Nick found that he actually had perfect timing as he spotted Astoria leaving the place feebly. Nick saw the curse flaring up within her at this point and secretly pulsed a reverse magical wave to forcefully calm it down as she passed by him. Astoria didn't notice this but clearly felt better as her footsteps became more stable. Nick nodded in satisfied with this and stealthily slipped into the hospital wing while avoiding the detection wards placed at the entrance. He knew that they were there not to detect trespassers but to inform Madame Pomfrey of incoming patients. Chapter 496, Suspicions The elderly Medi which in question was cleaning up with a depressed expression that Nick could understand. To someone that has dedicated their life to healing others being helpless to stop an illness was a disheartening thing. Luckily Nick was here to save the day this time and he secretly infiltrated the Medi witch's mind before leaving the information she needed with a small nudge so that she thinks she figured out the issue. Nick watched as her face lit up in realization once the implanted knowledge showed up as a thought and she hurriedly chased after Astoria once she double-checked to see if it was even a viable possibility. Well it looks like my work here is done. Nick thought with a smile before leaving the area stealthily. About five days later the matter blew up dramatically as the Greengrass family made a public announcement about being cured of their blood curse thanks to Madame Pomfrey. Apparently the cure put Daphne in such a good mood that she was all smiles for several days much to the discomfort of many. She had a bit of a reputation as a cold person so seeing her smiling so much threw quite a few off. The best part in Nick's opinion was that she clearly didn't suspect him at all to be behind the matter. That didn't mean no one else did though as the day before the announcement was made Madame Pomfrey had visited the headmaster's office. Ah Poppy what brings you this evening? Dumbledore asked in a friendly manner. It's about this whole blood curse business Albus. Madame Pomfrey said seriously. Is there something wrong with the cure you devised? Dumbledore asked concerned. She shook her head no, the cure itself works splendidly, the problem is the source of the cure. She stated honestly. What do you mean? Dumbledore asked confused. Madame Pomfrey sighed after thinking over it a lot I have reason to believe that it was not my own idea but one planted in my mind. She said sternly. Dumbledore frowned is there any evidence to support this theory? He asked and she nodded. Whoever did it was SK asterisk LLED at the mind art beyond anything I have ever seen but clearly didn't realize that I had an extra set of defenses that did not function the same as the shields but rather work to find any foreign magical signatures attached to memories since tampering always leaves a trace of it behind. She explained seriously. But if this is true then why would they go so far to give you the cure for that specific curse and not look at your memories? Dumbledore asked confused. They both knew that her knowledge was extremely precious so the fact someone would secretly infiltrate her mind and not look at them but rather just leave behind knowledge instead was hard to understand. I have been asking myself that same question this entire time and I have a theory that explains it but is confusing as well. I believe whoever did this didn't want anyone to know it was them and used me as a scapegoat in this matter. Madame Pomfrey said honestly. Dumbledore's eyes widened before he smiled and chuckled I believe I have an idea as to who it was and why it was done like this. You can accept the credit freely and let your mind be at ease as they likely meant well in this case. He said reassuringly and Madame Pomfrey sighed in relief and chose to drop the matter. I hope you know what you are doing Nick the old wizard thought as Madame Pomfrey left his office. He was not as ignorant to the things Nick was studying as Nick thought and was likely the only person in the world truly aware of just how monstrously ahead of his peers Nick was. He had after all been monitoring the parts of the library Nick frequented through the wards there and thus had long figured out about Nick's gift of language. Dumbledore did not know what it was that drove Nick to seek improvement so fervently but he hoped that when he reaches the point he seeks that he doesn't lose touch with the rest of the world like so many do. 
Nick of course wasn't aware of any of this and even if he was it wouldn't bother him at all as by this point he held the knowledge of a tier 4 or new tier 5. His SK asterisk LL at deploying that knowledge was also rapidly improving as he was confident to be able to defeat even high tier 3s like Snape and Helena without much issue if it came to it. All the while he drew closer and closer to true immortality as he deciphered more and more of the Didric book. Chapter 497, Friends Summer break was rapidly approaching and Nick wanted to completely prepare for his binding of the realm before it arrived so he chose to leave the lexicon's knowledge on hold until he did. This wasn't to say that Nick didn't take a couple days to relax or often hung out with his friends that were cramming for the upcoming exams. No no, like this. He said while helping Ron with the practical portion of the charm's practice. Merely watching someone perform something was not enough for the redhead to pick it up so Nick was moving the boy's wand hand so he could feel what he needed to do instead. Nick had long since figured out that Ron was far from untalented but due to the fact he couldn't learn in the standard way he regularly underperformed. Teaching him in this much more hands-on way let the redhead improve rapidly. Is this correct? Tracy asked as she showed Nick a runic sentence since she was studying for her runes exam. This part here should be like this actually. Nick said as he tapped on the paper with his finger causing another very similar runic sentence to appear on it with notes and arrows pointing out the differences. This was actually one of the greatest gains Nick had gotten from Slytherin's library, Wandless Magic. Towards the end of the library the founder had a few tomes on his experiences in the use of magic without a wand alongside his theories on why it was supposed to be so difficult. Basically wizards who use wands have trained their bodies to that method thus when they start trying to use magic wandlessly it feels unnatural and so they struggle to overcome this hurdle. Slytherin also postulated that wandless magic had different rules than magic with a wand so it was inefficient as the wizard forces it with what they knew to work with wands. The final theory was that it depended on the purity of one's magic and the strength of one's soul that determined how easy it was to use the stuff. After attempting wandless casting following the founder's method Nick felt rather irritated because it was practically second nature to him. He knew why too as in terms of purity of mana and strength of soul he was monstrously high in both. Even further he had experience in wandless casting due to his elemental bloodline and his animagus abilities. There was still a bit of trouble adapting his SK asterisk LL in magic to a wandless version and of course there was a steep drop in power behind each spell he cast wandlessly due to how inefficient it was but only to about the level of the average Hogwarts graduate which was more than adequate for most things. The only exception to this was when he used transfiguration magic as his supreme talent in the art now made him more dangerous than ever as he only needed a thought to shift his surroundings to his will. Hey just how far ahead of us are you anyways? Tracy asked after seeing the wandless spell. Hmm, in pure knowledge a bit under Dumbledore and in terms of SK asterisk LL about the same level as Mkanagal and Snape. To be fair though I am a bit of a workaholic with too much free time to constantly push my knowledge and SK asterisk LL forward. Nick answered after thinking about it for a moment. Way to make us feel like baggage. Harry joked and everyone laughed. Nick shrugged like I said too much free time. He said in mock helplessness. Still it's hard to believe you are the same age as most of us. Daphne said and everyone nodded in agreement. I'm just built different I guess. Nick said not really bothered by the difference in ability between him and his friends. After all he didn't become friends with them for their ability to keep up with him but rather because as individuals he can relax around them and just generally vibe with their personalities, after a bit of personal growth on their parts of course. Ron is no longer the jealous ignorant idiot he was at the beginning, Hermione is a much more personable person and actually pretty chill most of the time now and even Luna is usually all smiles and generally in a good mood. Daphne and Tracy never really needed personal growth but rather a slight change in situations to really open up. All in all the group just sort of clicked together around Nick as its center which he was fine with. The best part in his opinion was that in many ways each and every one of his chosen friends was way ahead of the rest of their peers just by the benefits of associating with him on a regular basis. Chapter 498 Orders well. The elder at the Order of the Golden Sands had been in a bad poor mood for quite some time now. It was hard not to be when the reports from the spy within Hogwarts all but confirmed that Nick was no longer someone they could easily erase. Even more the person that was working on cracking the ward around the island had seemingly vanished from the face of the planet. Curse that woman for ever giving birth to this brat, the elder thought as he signed off on the death of that person after the grace period ended. Things have been going downhill ever since Nick was born as due to who his father was the entire order scorned his mother for the first ten years of his life. The woman was no simple character however and actively worked against the order's interests as a result causing irreparable damage to it by destroying valuable resources in such a manner no one could figure out the culprit. 
even then the woman was little more than a nuisance as she never crossed the line about what she could or could not do. That was until the exile happened that is. Through an ancient ritual Nick was tested on his talent and potential only to be found a squib. As per the Order's long-held tradition the brat was mind-wiped about everything related to the Order and exiled to the Muggle world to fend for himself. This proved to be the final straw for the woman who in her fury destroyed every tome of knowledge collected over the last five centuries forcing the Order to execute her. But at that point it was already too late and the Elder could easily foresee the Order's decline as their foundation had been almost entirely destroyed. The Elder had treated the brat like all squids and ignored his existence until he showed up at Hogwarts three years ago. The spy at the school couldn't believe it and reported the matter but the Elder in his hubris ignored it as a fluke of the ritual since the brat couldn't be talented or anything right. Oh how reality just loved to prove him wrong as the boy showed himself to be gifted to an extreme degree. A brand new method of enchantment and monstrous pace of learning magic were shown brilliantly to the world. Then it happened and Dumbledore meddled with the brat's past and exposed the fact that the Ravenclaw bloodline still existed. Even after all this however the brat was merely an eyesore to the elder but not something that required him to admit his folly. That changed when the brat started to do increasingly concerning feats of magic that were seen on a global scale such as creating a way to give ghosts physical bodies. Not to say him freeing Black from Azkaban and getting Pettigrew executed wasn't important but merely that he got no public credit for it really. Still while a little bit of attention was getting draw to the order from this stuff it was not enough to approach the brat yet. That changed when he publicly showed off that horrid familiar of his that by all reports was an equally monstrous existence in a beauty pageant of all things. Those that recognized the boy's features as belonging to his mother and uncle from past experiences started to question the order about their intentions by having such a prodigy standing out in the public. Showing the records of the boy's exile managed to get these people to back off but the elder knew the brat needed to be curbed soon as he was starting to become a problem for the order. Unfortunately the spy at Hogwarts couldn't get to much information on the brat due to his secretive nature so when that whole debacle with the Sturm vampire clan happened the vampires hit the order, hard. Even showing the boy's exile record only placated the leeches slightly but not enough to stop them from interfering with the order's operations. That was the last straw that broke the camel's back and the elder declared a hunt on the brat's head. As it was obvious at this point the brat was far more powerful than expected and handedly chased off his uncle from that island while fatally injuring him upon escape. The elder was furious at being so heavily acknowledged as at fault for allowing the brat to grow to such a degree. For the first time in a long time the order was forced to admit their helplessness and offered the brat an ultimatum type bargain. In truth the elder knew it was not something that they could make good on if the brat chose to ignore it as he was now backed by enough influential and powerful people that the order would be crushed like a bug if the brat was truly targeted by them. Chapter 499, Time of Peace It was a bluff to try and preserve the order's prestige and like all good bluffs the only one aware of it was the elder that set it up to begin with. It was done in such a way as well that it was an extremely convincing one as well as even Dumbledore believed it. On the other side of the world however there was another man with two different colored eyes that had seen it with his own seer abilities and scoffed at it. That wasn't to say Grindelwald couldn't appreciate the depth of the bluff merely that he knew how pointless it was. He had observed much of Nick's actions long before he ever even thought of them using his seer powers and had long since deduced the boy's personality. Nick was fairly peaceful all things considered as he rarely ever actively sought someone out to harm them but instead waited for his enemies to come to him before destroying them. If an animal needed to be chosen to represent him then Grindelwald would say Nick was much like a phoenix or thunderbird in attitude. He was slow to anger and proud of all he had but was a force to be reckoned with if angered to violence. As such Grindelwald thought it only fitting that the boy's animagus form be the offspring of both that was nobler than any other bird. If anything though Grindelwald was apologetic towards Nick and those he sacrificed for his grand ritual. For Nick it was because he knew what he would unleash upon the earth by doing this but believed it was the best option for wizarding kind despite this. For his victims it was because he made a point to learn the fate of all he sacrificed should he not have and thus was truly sorry for ripping that future away from them, for the greater good. None of this mattered to Nick however as he was focusing heavily on digesting the information within the Didric book. One might ask how it could take so long to read a book but there was a difference between understanding the contents and merely reading the words written. It was a bit like a cookbook full of recipes when you didn't know what the ingredients, units of measurement and techniques for the recipes were. Sure you could still read and even memorize the recipes themselves but you couldn't make any of them despite that. What Nick was doing was slowly learning what the terms used in the book meant and slowly piecing together all the details into usable form as a result. This was a slow process but one that he was more than willing to subject himself to because the reward was well worth it. With the abomination dead and gone and the order silent Nick finally had peace to just strive towards his goals as he himself had nothing pressing to worry about. 
This didn't mean that nothing happened as he steady drew closer to fully understanding the contents of the Didrick book however. In fact the exact opposite was true as Harry had unknowingly crossed into Tier 1 which was to say his mana quantity had reached the same level as the average Hogwarts graduate. His SK asterisk LL was nowhere near that point though but Nick expected as much since while talented Harry simply didn't have the drive to push himself to the fullest. He had no reason to as Voldemort was dead and as far as he was aware that was the only thing that was really his problem to deal with. Nick agreed that was actually true for the most part since Grindelwald was technically not an issue while the returning gods were firmly his own problem to solve, with help of course. Another interesting thing that happened was that Nick had been invited by Vlad and the royal vampires to a ball held on Beltane. It was the only time they were all present at the same location at once and while that might seem like a vampire hunter's wet dream it very much wasn't. One or two royal vampires could be handled by a SK asterisk LLED hunter but one or two hundred. Not a snowball's chance in hell would that go well for the hunters. Nick wasn't the only non-vampire invited to the ball either as quite a few others were likely to be there as well. The Flammels, various old wizards from around the world and there was even a possibility of Grindelwald himself being there since the man was on good terms with Vlad. Nick figured he would go either way simply because it was a good opportunity to relax and expand his network of contacts for the future. Chapter 500, Time of Peace, 2 Nick had also gotten a new mission that he found rather pointless from the system as well during this period of peace. Mission Conditions Established Description, Your ambitions and unique existence have driven you to seek hegemony through realm lordship and you are on the edge of stepping onto this treacherous and difficult path. Objectives, Bind a realm to yourself, Discard your physical form to be truly reborn, Optional, Perfect your realm's incomplete laws before the start of the next school year, Optional. Rewards, Lord's Presence, Ability, Waters of the Soul, Book, Optional. Optional. Status, Incomplete. While Nick could appreciate the system approving his chosen path it seemed a bit over the top to just get handouts for doing what he planned anyways. The first optional objective was also entirely pointless to have as well because it was off the table. Nick's body was very much still needed in order to fully maximize his growth so discarding it was out of the question. He knew for a fact that when he eventually did lose his body and was reborn from the waters of his realm the form he will take is unlikely to look human at all. Dedra always have inhuman features that give away their nature and Nick doubted that his form would be much different. One had to keep in mind that despite being mostly elf in essence he also had Dedric and celestial bird parts as well that would no doubt show up on his reborn form. With that understood Nick had no intention of discarding his body until it he had no choice or he grew so powerful that he no longer needed to maintain the charade of him being human which was admittedly approaching rapidly as his power grew by the day. By his calculations around his sixth year in fact was when he should reach high tier 4 at the very least. The truth of the matter was that Nick wasn't entirely sure how powerful he would be by that point as he assumed that Grindelwald's ritual will have been completed by then and he won't have an upper ceiling of power anymore. Speaking of upper ceilings of power Nick had a slight issue with a ritual he found in Slytherin's library towards the end of it. This ritual in particular was designed by Salazar but had never been used as he didn't find any of his descendants at that time worthy of it and he was far too old to do it himself. He referred to it as the true path ceremony and it was a ritual set over seven days. Well that wasn't entirely accurate as to be correct it was seven different rituals that were done one day after the last. Salazar explained in his tomes on the subject that there was a certain amount of time that the magic of a ritual needed to set in a permanent manner within a body. Using an uncomfortable amount of experiments he figured out that it was usually between 20 and 70 hours on average. The True Path Ceremony used this to create a qualitative improvement effect by stacking effects together from rituals before the magic could set in place. The final result was a full overhauling of one's magical system from the core to the bloodline abilities. The catch was that skipping a single ritual in the set cripples the magic of the one undergoing it and that only those still maturing magically could undergo the ceremony. Now one would assume that this would be a perfect ritual for Nick to undergo so long as he modified it for his own personal use but that was where the issue came up. The ingredients for the ritual have long since gone extinct as far as everyone knew and there was a lot of ingredients needed. Nick knew he could get some of these through the royal vampires who most likely had a few in storage but for others he had no clue how he would get them save a single dreadful idea, temporal manipulation. In his first year when he was dumb and ignorant of what that entailed Nick fantasized about owning a vast garden with extinct ingredients plucked from just before they would have been lost originally. At this point however he knew just how insane that actually was to do as he not only needed to be able to pinpoint the exact ingredient at the exact time it would have been destroyed but he also needed to cancel the time slip effect that happened when something moved from the past to the future. 
Time always sought to uphold its authority so when some arrogant wizard tries to go back in time, it causes them to experience all the time from when they went back to the present at once which meant an inconsequential few hours to a full-blown amount of centuries in an instant, hence the name Time Slip. Chapter 501, Mastery and Domains Ironically Nick wasn't worried about being affected by time slipping himself as an elf his lifespan was pretty much infinite but the problem came in the form of the ingredients as well as what effect it would have on him. Obviously the ingredients would crumble away and render the trip pointless but even further Nick himself would end up fully matured which would also render the trip pointless as only someone with maturing magic could undergo the ceremony. Nick had easily thought of a few possible ideas that might work to fix these problems but each one was horribly difficult. For example he could rebuild the drones he had gotten from the Dmur ruin as time had little effect on the things while they were active thus meaning the time slipping wouldn't cause any trouble for them. At that point he merely needed to find a way to isolate and purge the temporal energies that would try and affect the ingredients the drones would collect for him and he would be able to collect whatever he wanted from history without issue. As should be obvious however if he had such a mastery of time magic then he wouldn't have this issue to begin with and gaining that sort of mastery was no easy feat. In fact doing so was probably more difficult than creating a whole new realm once again. The thing about realm creation from what Nick could see was that you don't need much mastery over the fundamental forces of one such as time and space. Rather you actually only need a tiny amount of each of these forces power to be combined correctly in order to create an incomplete realm like what Nick currently had. From there it is merely a matter of adding more and more of these forces power to the realm to expand it and complete it into a full world. The fact was that there was no real need for mastery of these forces in order to create a realm but merely resources. On the flip side however if one wanted to create an entire world instantly then mastery was required to do so. That was how Celebrimber's world had been born after all as the Einar and Vala were born with absolute mastery of their respective forces and elements that sang the song of creation that fused that mastery into a full-blown world from the start. In fact these beings could be considered gods that were born with these domains innately and used them to create that world. For one of them to manipulate the forces of time should they have that domain would be easy but Nick was no god nor did he possess any inkling of that domain. It was ironically very easy to determine what domains one was generally attuned to just by seeing what sort of magics they are most talented at. Nick's domains for example would be crafting, souls, fire, lightning, weather, birds, languages and magic. To clarify having a domain of magic didn't refer to magic in general but rather magical energy or mana. All in all Nick's domains were varied and wide-reaching but had very clear distinctions between them. In the same vein Dumbledore had the domains of fire, alchemy, and magic from what Nick knew of the man. It should be clarified that having more domains didn't necessarily mean more powerful as in fact the opposite was normally true. Having fewer domains meant far less time and effort to elevate one's understanding and mastery of their domains to a higher level. Where Nick had to separate his energy between eight domains Dumbledore split his between three or possibly four so he obviously had much faster progress in them than Nick did. Or at least that would be the case if Nick wasn't cheating by having a system that let him have access to resources Dumbledore had no hope of matching, books on subjects from other worlds, materials from other worlds, crafting methods and styles from other worlds and all of the same things from this one. There was a vast gap between the resources available to each of them and it showed as Nick was rapidly catching up to the old man while the old goat could only rely on his own effort and severely limited resources to improve himself. Needless to say if Nick didn't have the system his own growth would probably slow down to around the same level as the old goats if perhaps a little faster due to the knowledge and SK asterisk LL he already possessed. Anyway Nick had nowhere near the amount of mastery required to snatch the ingredients from the past which left him little choice beyond sucking it up and shelling out the points the system gouges for the ingredients he couldn't get through the vampires. Comment. 14 Comment. Vote. Chapter 502, Pain in the Pocket. That was what Nick did too as he informed Vlad and the other royal vampires who held a messaging mirror of the list of things he needed for the ceremony. Is this list accurate? Not to pry but much of this is extinct or nearly extinct and all have uses in rituals. Vlad messaged back nearly immediately. I am aware of that and in fact I do need them for a series of rituals I wish to undergo. Nick replied honestly since it was pointless to hide his reason for wanting the ingredients. Vlad merely needed to glance at the list to see the commonality shared by the ingredients and by extension why Nick wanted them. I do hope you reconsider whatever rituals it is that you are planning as just from the ingredients required I can tell that they will alter you fundamentally as a wizard and thus pose grave danger should something go awry Vlad sent back seriously. I am aware of the risks but they are necessary. Not to worry though as I will not rush the matter but ensure that all possibilities within my control are accounted for. Nick sent to offer reassurance. 
Very well as I see that you won't be dissuaded I can only hope that your preparations prove adequate. After that Vlad sent Nick a list of his own of the ingredients that he possessed as well as his prices for them. Nick could only hiss at the prices attached while being surprised by how many Vlad had from the list he sent originally. Nearly half of the total amount of ingredients in fact with some being unusually cheap suspiciously enough. Does this guy have a garden of these things or something? Nick thought as he noticed most of the cheaper things were plants that could be cultivated with enough effort. For the things that couldn't be cultivated however the price never went below 10,000 galleons. Such a price was extreme even for Nick to pay with his fortune but he couldn't say it wasn't fair as most of these ingredients could be considered family heirlooms for wizarding families. So with a pained wallet Nick shelled out nearly 2 million galleons leaving his fortune at a mere 157,000 galleons. Still a lot to be sure but Nick was no longer considered uber wealthy as he had less money than the Malfoys by quite a bit. At least I have money pouring in from Blitzball so while this is a heavy expenditure I will eventually recover. Nick thought to try and ease the pain that came from handing out such a vast amount of money. Nick's perception of wealth was rather skewed but even he could understand that what he had paid was a stupid high amount of money. That didn't even count the percentage that the goblins took for facilitating the trade. Unfortunately Nick soon found out that his luck for collecting the ingredients ended with Vlad as the rest of the royal vampire only had one or two additional ingredients and also charged a vast amount for them. There were a few however that thankfully only wanted a few custom enchanted pieces of equipment for their ingredients which was a trade Nick was all too happy to take. Over the next month or so Nick got in the ingredients and even witnessed the dragon eggs hatching under Hagrid's care. The scene was actually a bit funny as the half-giant was in tears of joy during the event while even Dumbledore who was present marveled at it. Remarkable creatures these dragons, look at these scales that seem to actively absorb the magic from the air and how they thrive within this extreme heat. Dumbledore commented as he inspected the dragon hatchlings. Nick wasn't surprised to see that the old goat didn't seem to notice how this dragons were not naturally evolved as all traces of the magic used to alter their previous generations had been truly integrated into their biology and thus looked natural. Nick didn't plan on pointing it out either as that would bring up questions he didn't want to share the answers to. For example where he found them exactly and who or what modified the species originally. All of these were secrets that Nick had no intention of sharing with the wizarding word at large through Dumbledore. To be fair to the old goat he had been surprisingly chill about the whole situation and only wanted the best for the new species of dragons that had been undiscovered until now due to their habitat and small population. Nick had moved the small colony of dragons to a nearby volcano and told Dumbledore that was where they had been found which the old man accepted easily enough. Chapter 503 Preparations the huge ancient dragon that held the memories and soul of the Dwemer was not taken from the molten lake of course since that would condemn it at death as it was tier 5 but the rest of the species was moved. The big dragon didn't even care as it had been alone for an uncountable amount of years in the molten lake so not having others of the species there didn't bother it at all. The Easter break came and went before it was finally time for the exams to start up and things got hectic around the school for most students. Nick wasn't amongst those numbers as he had long since taken the individualized tests by the professors on the subjects and passed with perfect marks in everything except herbology which he had trouble with the practical portion as per normal for him. The additional classes he took the exams for besides the core classes had a weird air to them as the professors tried their hardest to have him stumble. Nick knew it was about their pride as teachers that didn't want them to just admit that their classes were useless to him. Besides helping his friends study and dealing with the pain of buying the ingredients for the ritual Nick focused his whole attention on the Didrick book and finally he managed to fully understand it in its entirety. He was finally ready to bind the realm to himself at any point he wished. There was still preparations to be made however as Nick needed to collect the rest of the ingredients for the rituals as well as a few things to feed the realm in order to complete its laws thus solidifying it as a much weaker version of a true world rather than the incomplete state it was in at the moment. Hagstones, cloud essence, volcanic crystals, iceberg hearts, life energy, and several other things needed to be accumulated to feed their laws and concepts to the realm to complete it. The most important however was a ley line core. Ley lines were basically the magical blood vessels of the world and if Nick wanted his own realm to passively generate magic by itself he needed to have the law rule added for it to have its own ley lines. Thus he required a ley line core that was created by the same law of the world and was where a ley line originated. Few wizards were foolish enough to openly own such a thing however as taking the core was the same as removing a ley line entirely from the world so while it was a very useful thing for a wizard it was also strictly and heavily taboo. That was why Nick was very secretive when he dove down into the sea far from any other wizards and then into the seabed below that to the ley line there. Even as he struggled with the vast amount of magic around him Nick removed the core and left hurriedly since a ley line disappearing even in such a far away area would be spotted immediately. 
he was correct too as on a global scale attention was immediately turned to that ley line once the core was removed and every ministry anywhere near it mobilized investigators. Nick had taken precautions however so even if the matter of someone having taken the core was known there was no traces of that person remaining on the site of the crime making it impossible to find him unless he was stupid enough to openly show it off. With the core in hand though Nick finally had everything he needed for this summer break when he would bind the realm to himself. The exams were barmy this year, it was like they somehow made them even harder somehow. Ron complained when Nick was hanging out with his friends after the exams. Oh don't be absurd, the exams were the same as they always are you simply didn't study hard enough. Hermione chastised. Not everyone can spend all their time studying for the exams like you my own. Ron said defensively. Nick does perfectly fine studying all time. Hermione defended her answer by throwing Nick under the bus. Afraid I'm with Ron on this one Hermione. I'm a freak of nature so not really a great option to choose to back you up. Nick said with a grin. Speaking of you studying whatever happened to that weird book you've been obsessed with recently? Tracy asked curiously. I finished understanding the contents so naturally I am no longer reading it. Nick said honestly. Must have been something strange to take you that long to understand since I've seen you read an entire book once and never pick it up again. Daphne said and everyone nodded. Comment. 17 Comment. Vote. Chapter 504, Preparations, 2. It doesn't matter since I doubt there is anyone else who could use the information within it anyways. Nick said with a shrug. That doesn't make sense as if only you could use the information then who wrote the book. Hermione asked with furrowed brows and clear confusion. You misunderstand me, only I can use the information because as a prerequisite there are a few innate factors that need to be fulfilled that I honestly can't see anyone else fulfilling. I might be wrong of course but I doubt it. Nick clarified honestly. He meant it too as the very minimum requirements for binding a realm were having to drink essence to at least some degree, having a powerful soul and of course having a realm to bind in the first place. Having even one of these in this world was difficult but all three was something only someone with a system like Nick could achieve as Didra simply can't survive in this world as it currently is. Nick himself is only partly Didric in essence and is still maturing magically so he is able to skirt this problem for the time being. As for obtaining a realm it was indeed possible for a wizard to create one with the right information and effort. It wouldn't be as efficient as the method Nick used but it was very much possible to do. Seems foolish to think no one else can use the information, what if you are wrong? Hermione pressed not willing to concede. Then I am wrong, not that it matters anyway. Nick said with a shrug since he wasn't going to argue with her over it. Nick thought it funny that he tended to keep most information he has close to his chest but as he grew closer and closer to the pinnacle of power currently in this world he has gotten much more free about sharing. After all why should he have to hide it when he overpowers nearly everyone in the world minus perhaps a couple handfuls of people? What was that book about anyways? Harry asked curiously. It was about soul and dimensional magics when it is broken down into its basic parts. Very deep and powerful stuff all in all. Nick said with a proud smile. Where do you even find a book on something like that? Ron asked dumbfounded. Oh you know, places. Before any of you ask, no you can't borrow the book. You wouldn't be able to read it and I am not teaching you how either. Nick said calmly while munching on a chocolate walnut and peanut butter cookie. A slash N. If you want the recipe just ask, Hermione looked upset at that but Nick didn't really care as while he was all for helping his friends grow as wizards he wasn't going to unnecessarily share his secrets. The Didric rune language was just one of those things that he wanted to selfishly keep to himself. That reminds me but I need to work on upgrading my Atronax since while an army of them is nice it won't be much use if they get K asterisk LLED by random people when I send them out. Nick thought while making a note of it. While Nick had been away from the island Dottie had been in charge of creating new Atronax and then teleporting them to the area set aside for them. Atronax were very passive creatures normally and thus just stayed in place until Nick took the time to stop by and give them purpose. The unfortunate part was that most of these Atronax were the inferior sort and thus pretty weak. For the flame variant Atronax Nick could easily upgrade them by exposing them to magical flames of different types but for the others he needed a little more effort, though not enough to be a problem. Besides improving the Atronax Nick also wanted to collect the rest of the ingredients for the ceremony so he could complete that before he started binding his realm. Call it instinct or intuition but Nick had a feeling that after binding his realm he will lose the opportunity to gain anything permanent from rituals. 
He understood where this feeling came from as well as after some thought on it he realized that as a Didric realm lord his essence would be unaffected by any rituals after he binds his realm so when he loses his body and is reborn from his realm he will be back to the state he was before the rituals. Sure his new body will be more mature but whatever magical alterations he underwent in an unnatural manner after he bound his realm would be removed. Chapter 505, Rebuilt It was a bit inconvenient as far as Nick was concerned but otherwise a small price to pay for the immortality that binding the realm would bring. Still Nick wanted to complete the ceremony before he bound his realm in order to make sure that the huge benefits of it would remain even if he lost his body. Modifying the ceremony was already done by this point and after shelling out a good 500,000 points to the system he also had all the ingredients for the ceremony. With that taken care of Nick informed everyone that he was going to be out of touch for the next week or so. The ceremony required him to be in a place that had a vast amount of mana which in this case was the island for Nick. In addition to that though Nick could not have anything on his person at all, not even his clothes or wand. Considering how hard it was to carve the ritual circles Nick made sure to carve each of them in the same room at the same time before he removed everything from his body and began the first ritual. Being the sneaky bastard he was Salazar had created the entire ritual set with parcel tongue commands. Nick however had gotten far greater control of his language ability and thus was able to actively speak the language without aid with a bit of trouble. The first ritual was the primer for the rest and purposefully destabilized one's magical core and circuit network. Doing so was needless to say heavily damaging to one's body as the rampant energy started to attack his flesh and blood. This was part of the process though and lead into the second ritual that forced that same rampaging mana to be assimilated into each of the cells of one's body. This created a magical conductivity to each cell that made casting magic with one's body easier as if the flesh and bone had become a wand core in and of themselves. The cells too weak to adapt to this change were rejected from the body violently which moved into the third ritual. This ritual worked to boost one's vitality by tying it to their mana that healed and strengthened the body as a whole. It also had the benefit of improving one's natural healing ability based on their power. The fourth to seventh rituals were where Salazar warned held the highest chance of problems cropping up. The fourth ritual destroyed one's entire mana circuit system and forced the body to absorb the fragments to be reused in the fifth ritual. The fifth ritual rebuilt the mana circuits from scratch without any obstructions or useless pathways at all and required the one undergoing the ritual to remain perfectly still. Once the mana circuits were reformed however they were flooded with mana to forcefully expand and strengthen them when the same thing was done with the mana core with the sixth and seventh rituals. At the end of, of this seventh day Nick felt incredible while also filled with a sense of weakness at the same time. It was an odd sensation to say the least but he knew that the suffering he had endured was worth it as he felt his entire body thrumming with power. Checking the status in the system he couldn't help but laugh uproariously as he saw that he had entered tier 4. Even more Nick knew that any flaw that had been innate to his body was entirely gone after the rituals had effectively rebuilt him from the foundation up. The changes to his anatomy from his prior rituals as well as the imperfect mana circuit system that was left over from transforming from a human to a celestial elf was also gone. In its place was a mana circuit system that perfectly suited his race and he was surprised by the difference. Before he had assumed his circuits to be impressively high in number but compared to now it was a joke. Mana flowed beneath his skin and through his flesh and blood almost like a huge complicated spider web. He now understood just how incompatible his old mana circuit system was with his body and felt conflicted. The elves in Celebrimbor's world were descendants of beings that were easily considered gods here with almost no human impurity at all so the entire race was born with dense mana circuits that made them superior to any other race in magical talent. Add on the influence of the celestial bird and Nick's new mana circuits were monstrously powerful. In a way I knew this was going to be the case but it's hard to accept just how unfair of an advantage this is. Nick thought with a sigh. Comment. 17 Comment. Vote. Chapter 506 suppression and revealed. There was a problem however that Nick was helpless to solve with his new power and mana system, he couldn't suppress his presence anymore. Reaching tier 4 and gaining this new mana system had fully integrated his inhuman nature into his mana and so he simply couldn't hide it anymore. Before his presence could be hidden because his mana system was still that of a human's despite his race being different in truth but now he had an inhuman mana system and thus couldn't hide his nature anymore. Rather he could hide it but only by cloaking his entire magical presence. That would prove awkward however as whether they realize it or not most wizards rely on someone's mana presence to notice or understand someone. By entirely cloaking his mana presence Nick would cause most wizards to subconsciously ignore his physical presence while also effectively telling everyone that he was hiding something. No matter what he did it was a lose-lose type situation for Nick. He could only sigh I always knew that I would eventually reveal my race but I hadn't expected it to be so soon he thought as he left the ritual room of the manor. 
he got dressed in the clothes he left outside the door and picked up his wand only to frown when he noticed that it had trouble adapting to his new power. He understood why too as he had take a qualitative and quantitative leap forward and the wand needed time to adjust to his new power. In truth Nick knew he likely no longer required a wand to perform magic perfectly but he had gotten used to using one and simply couldn't imagine not having it. You all right boss? Lucas asked concerned as he walked into the hallway Nick was in. Yeah I'm fine why? Nick asked seriously. Well it's just you have this whole feel to you that is making it hard to think straight as all my instincts are screaming at me to run away. Lucas admitted nervously. Nick frowned and withdrew his mana to under his skin which caused Lucas to sigh in relief. Mana suppression or a mix of my greater power and elvish presence, he pondered seriously. Now that I think of it doesn't Dumbledore have a similar effect on those much weaker than him? Like he usually keeps it under wraps but when he is upset or fighting it slips out and makes others frightful. Nick thought seemingly figuring it out. It was pretty easy to figure out that the problem came from entering Tier 4 which was a qualitative upgrade from Tier 3 in terms of mana density and amount. It was thus easy to understand how the mana presence of such a being would naturally create a suppressive felling in those weaker than them. Looks like Luna is going to be upset at me for quite some time. Nick thought with a chuckle. Luna still relied on reading people's mana outside their bodies in order to fully understand them and so she hated it when Nick retracted his mana into his body. At this point however he honestly had no real choice in the matter as it was either that or causing everyone else to be uncomfortable. With more than a little dread at the inevitable conversation Nick left the island and appeared in Hogwarts after transforming into his animagus form and flying out of the wards. He of course chose to appear in the workshop and disillusion himself before making his way to Dumbledore's office. The old goat didn't seem surprised at all when Nick walked into the office despite his presence being unrestrained. It seems you have finally chosen to stop hiding. The old goat said casually without even looking up from his paperwork. So you already knew, how long? Nick asked not truly surprised by the revelation. Since you caught that strange illness that no one could figure out. In truth I believed it truly was an illness until I spoke to Nico about it and he told me what was truly happening. A rather violent rejection your body had to being transformed wasn't it? Dumbledore said calmly. Why do you seem to not care that I am not human? Nick asked genuinely confused. Wizards have persecuted other magical races for as long as recorded history so Dumbledore seeming to not care was plain hard to understand. You are not the first to become something other than human and you will likely not be the last. In some ways it is only natural to discard to weakness of being human for a wizard that seeks to master the arcane. The human body is not meant to hold great power, it never was after all. In a one-to-one -one comparison a wizard will always have less power than another magical creature but the difference is that unlike them we learned how to do more with less and thus dominate them. So for a wizard to cast off their human weakness to equal the power levels between them and other magical races while retaining their SK asterisk LL is to be expected unless they were stubborn like myself. Dumbledore explained with a gentle smile. Chapter 507, Discussion Perhaps but it should be clear that my new race is a bit special. Nick said honestly. Dumbledore nodded indeed, besides your appearance it is difficult to think of you as human when every one of my senses say otherwise. I believe the term that best describes you would be otherworldly. He said casually. If I were to say it was the result of a failed experiment how likely would that be to work? Nick asked seriously. It depends on who you are intending the excuse to work on, the average populace would easily accept it but those with true knowledge in magic would be skeptical if not disbelieving entirely. Dumbledore said honestly. So I need a better excuse or to settle for the vast majority of the wizarding world being fooled while the truly knowledgeable knowing the truth hey. Not much of a choice is it? Nick asked with a sigh. Dumbledore chuckled rarely do we even find the important choices in life so easy to make. If it is of any comfort you may know that Nico, Vlad, and myself will support you should this reveal bring you trouble. He said reassuringly. I can only thank you all in advance then. Nick said with a thankful smile. Now that your change is going to be public is there anything you are willing to share about this new race? Dumbledore asked curiously. Ah uh, now there's the researcher that discovered the uses of dragon blood with flamel, I had wondered if he had been buried by the professor and headmaster. Nick teased. Dumbledore shrugged I always knew that I would be sacrificing much of my time when I agreed to teach here at Hogwarts and that sacrifice grew even larger after taking the position of headmaster but I don't regret the choice even a little. He said with a nostalgic look as he was clearly remembering his many years at the school. Still it's hard not to wonder just how many things you might have discovered had you not made that choice. Nick said honestly. 
He knew for a fact that Dumbledore was no slouch academically but as the old man had said he sacrificed the vast majority of his time to the school so had made little progress with research compared to if he could spend the majority of his time on it. It won't do to dwell on that which has already passed too much. Now about your race. Dumbledore said getting the topic back on track. Not a whole lot different from being human physically speaking besides having much more sensitive senses and generally better physique innately. The big changes come in the form of the magical side of things as from what I understand the race basically grants a body very suited to magic including a powerful network of mana circuits that was much more intricate than a human's. The biggest difference however is that after reaching physical maturity at the age of 20 I will cease to age at all. Nick explained honestly. There was no reason to lie to the old man as while he had made questionable decisions in the past he had always acted with good intentions. Besides that all of this will eventually come to light anyways so Nick figured he may as well get it all out of the way now. Dumbledore seemed taken back after hearing all these details but smiled shortly afterwards. It would seem that congratulations are in order for becoming immortal. He said calmly. Nick shook his head I am not immortal but rather ageless he said while thinking though I will be solving that problem soon enough. Dot. The same could be said for vampires and yet they are well recognized as an immortal race despite being very mortal. You need not put your achievement down as very few can say that they broke free from the corrosive effects of time. Even more when unlike vampires your race truly does appear to be a true higher evolution of humanity, assuming you don't have any strange weaknesses like vampires of course. Dumbledore said with a proud look. Nick knew that that pride came from the old man's place as the headmaster of the school seeing one of his students succeed and make something of themselves. In a way it was a sort of personal pride more than the kind one gets from doing something that they consider an achievement, a pride by association of sorts. No weaknesses to speak of perhaps besides being a target of envy, not that I will be publicizing the details of my new race. Nick said with a smirk. Thanks for listening.